Hello, everyone. Welcome to the latest installment of the DBRS Morningstar webinar series. Today, we are covering topics observed in CMBS surveillance, and I am joined by my esteemed colleagues, Dave Coutro, Bill Tierney, Alex Sorlan, Braden Skirit, Tim Burke, and Wasik Chuktai. And we're going to walk you guys through some of the things that we've been looking at on the CMBS surveillance front in this very challenging year amid COVID. So we'll give it a few seconds for other attendees to join and then we'll get started. Okay. So I think we can get started with Dave Creature is going to walk us through some of the overview of trends and the rating process for the re recent reviews that we worked through. So I will pull up this PowerPoint. Can everybody see that? Okay, take it away, Dave. Good morning, everyone. Um, so as Gwen said, I'm gonna provide a walkthrough of, of some of the trends we've seen in, special, in, uh, in CMBS surveillance over the past year. Um, I guess, you know, it's been a year since COVID abruptly changed our daily lives and, and by extension, the landscape of commercial real estate and, and CMBS. Uh, so I'll provide an overview of, of our surveillance environment over the past year in general, and more specifically focus on the past six months as we reviewed our entire conduit book through the lens of COVID. Uh, so I'm gonna start uh, with a focus on special servicing rates. Uh, and I guess one thing to note kind of off, off the bat, um, you know, I think one of the things that became fairly apparent to us during the course of the pandemic was that delinquency rates uh, weren't as, as useful as a measure of risk as they typically are. And by that, I mean the, the standard progression that we see in CMBS of, of 30 days to 60 days to 90 days to foreclosure, um, sort of a linear progression that you know, gauges how far they are from their last payment. Uh, became less important because that that progression was being constantly disrupted by forbearances. So, you know, something that would appear to be 90 days delinquent that, you know, theoretically was a bit riskier than, than having missed one payment suddenly became current. Uh, so focusing on special servicing rates as, as more of a gauge of, of risk. Um, you know, as you can see from the graph here, uh, the special servicing rates started being effective, uh, affected almost immediately. Uh, the hotel rates uh, spike, you know, just after March of last year. So, you know, if you go back to March of last year, uh, you had sort of a complete instant cessation of, of cash flow coming through hotels. So, you know, that spiked almost immediately. You can see that the line increases pretty, pretty steeply there in April. And then retail lied by a couple of months and, you know, they had, you know, rental collections in place. So it, it took a month or two to manifest itself. But ultimately, um, uh, you know, both both ran to a pretty high uh, high degree. And the overall special servicing rate hit its high for this cycle in September of 2020 at 7.15%. Uh, uh, you can hit the next one, Glenn. So as we can see here, uh, this was, was fueled primarily by hotel and retail. Uh, I mentioned that the cyclical high overall from the market in September and you know, both property types, hotel and retail, hit their cyclical highs in September as well at 24.03% for hotel and 17.5% for retail uh, in that month. And on the hotel side, um, travel bans affected the entire sector almost immediately. And as a result, there's been a pretty uh, tight range between limited service and full service through this cycle, typically about 150 basis points, uh, within 150 basis points of each other in terms of special, uh, special servicing rates. So not a whole lot of differentiation on property subtypes within the hotel sector. Um, on the retail side of special servicing, it has been you know, primarily uh, regional mall based, uh, you know, and, and that's no surprise that the struggles of that of that sector, especially in the class B space have been very well publicized and with, you know, much larger uh, loan balances on those, you know, it's no surprise that they're driving the, uh, the retail special servicing rates in general. Um, in terms of some of the other property types, you know, you know just real quick office uh, has remained fairly steady, never really noticed a spike. And the April 2021 rate was just 64 basis points above the March 2020 rate. So you know, while there is some stress in there, it, it's it's not as outsized as as those other two property types. And the multifamily, industrial, and self storage uh, have have remained you know fairly flat and and you know sub one percent. Uh, so not a whole lot of stress coming through there yet. Uh, you can hit the next one, Glenn. So just a real quick comparison of the overall makeup of the specialty service universe. Uh, looking at you know just pre-pandemic and where we're at now. So if we go back to March of 2020, uh, you'll see retail was at at you know 
42% of the overall special servicing pop, uh, universe. Uh, with hotel at 16 and a half percent and, you know, of note office at 21 and a half percent at that point. And if we move forward to April 2021, you see that retail has remained sort of in that same 42, 43 percent range. Uh, hotel has has more than doubled as a you know contributor to the overall universe and office has decreased. And this is really a factor of the overall specialty service you know universe growing. Right. And hotel having a you know outpacing the other property types in terms of their contributions to this overall population. So, um, you know, not to suggest anything steady in the retail, but just, you know, your denominator is growing and, and retail has, has sort of stayed in line with that, whereas hotel has, has outpaced it. Um, so you can hop on to the next slide, Gwen. So another thing to note here, um, this is a snapshot of the April, 2021 specialty service universe. And one thing to note here is that, um, you know, nearly half the loans, or I guess going back to March 2020, nearly half the loans that were in special service at that time were sort of in the early stages, meaning either they remain current, were in their grace periods, or were less than 30 days delinquent. Uh, now that's that's shifted. You know, there's a, a high percentage now that's either truly delinquent or has, has passed it their maturities and have not paid off. And that 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 half number that I referred to with the the 30 days grace period and current has decreased to about 28 percent as of April of 2021. So, you know, the the stress that's out there in the special in the special servicing universe um, is real. It it, it is uh, manifesting itself um, as, as true delinquencies or or uh, maturity defaults. So moving to the next slide, um, in terms of you know what we're seeing in terms of loan workouts to date, uh, you know modifications have been most prevalent. About twenty three billion dollars of uh, of CMBS has been modified in some way, and just two notable trends that we saw uh, fairly early on. You know, going back to to last summer, as I, I think as as folks in the industry started to get a feel for what was um, you know kind of how things were, were progressing. Uh, two notable trends was one, it seemed like if there was really any common ground between a borrower and a, and a servicer to come to some sort of uh, forbearance or modification, those were happening pretty quickly. Uh, and the other thing was that the vast majority of these were done via non-transfer consents. So, you know, the special servicer okaying a modification or a forbearance without an actual transfer. And those two factors combined to, to kind of move some of these loans very quickly through that early workout stage and, and keep that special service number from, from growing too rapidly. Uh, in terms of, of how these modifications were were uh, effectuated, the forbearance are most common. About 57% of everything that's been modified to date uh, went through a forbearance, which is usually a three, uh, you know, a three or six month uh, break on PNI payments to be repaid over, you know, a following, you know, say six or 12 month period. Uh, the other, the other, the second most prevalent is, you know, the the always always popular other category. Um, in this case, you know, looking through uh, the, the notes on a lot of what was classified as other, uh, these typically involve suspending or repurposing reserve payments uh, or temporarily suspending debt service triggers. Um, so no, no actual break on the P&I, but maybe, you know, maybe you know, cutting off reserve payments for six months or, or allowing something to fail a trigger without uh, some of the repercussions. Um, and then in, ter in terms of reali realized losses, I I'll touch on that real briefly. Um, it it's been fairly minimal so far. Uh, just given the length of the workouts on these loans, it's, it, there's been a much slower resolution process than usual, um, especially when foreclosure appears to be the likely outcome. And this is a combination of, you know, just, you know, A, the volume, B, uh, there were states that have moratoriums in place on foreclosure filings. And then, you know, there's still continued market uncertainty as to where, uh, where values end up. So I think this all contributed to, to slower resolutions. Um, over the past 12 months, we've only seen uh, 11 uh, 11 loans uh, liquidated at losses greater than $10 million. And all but two of them were already with special prior to the pandemic. Um, and among those 11, there were two regional malls. Uh, and with the focus on, on the mall sector, it's worth noting that both of those loans saw losses in excess of 70% loss severities. Um, neither one of them, notably, neither one of them had been REO and the liquidations resulted from discounted payoffs um, in one case and a note sale in the other. So what did this mean in terms of our actual surveillance reviews? So if you can move to the next, yeah, thanks. Um, so we reviewed the entire conduit book between the fourth quarter of, of 2020 and into early 2021. And, you know, there were a lot of challenges, uh, you know, the volume, especially service loans, uh, a slow pace of new appraisals, you know, for a good portion of last year, you know, appraisers could not physically access property. So 
uh, there was a delay in having appraisals come through. Um, you know, there's ongoing negotiations for, for modifications and, and forbearances. Um, you know, as I mentioned previously, there were moratoriums in some states that led to a lack of clarity in terms of workout talks. Um, it was sort of hard to track progress in terms of you know, whether continued delinquency was because a borrower couldn't bring anything to the table or because the borrower you know, knew they didn't have to bring anything to the table because you know, uh, the servicer's hands were effectively tied at, at enforcing some of the mechanisms uh, until those moratoriums ended. And then in addition, we have you know, a lack of full year financial reporting. So you know, couldn't really gauge the entire effect of COVID um, you know, on a net cash flow basis for a good portion of the book. So this ultimately resulted um, on our conduit book um, in yep, uh, 275 bonds were downgraded across 67 transactions. Um, of those, 93 were investment grade bonds that were downgraded uh, and roughly half remained investment grade. The other half fell below investment grade. Um, and just you know, some numbers you know, of those that remained investment grade, uh, it was typically you know, just under a two notch, uh, a two notch downgrade on average. Uh, for things that fell below investment grade, that was roughly double, so just below four notches. Um, and, and I guess, you know, I, we've kind of touched on some of these things, uh, but in terms of drivers of of what was, uh, you know, the underlying, basically the underlying cause of, of a lot of the downgrades. So on the valuation side, um, you know, valuations that special services got post-transfer, uh, you know, showed significant value declines, especially, especially on regional malls. Uh, and obviously there was some pre-existing risk with, with retailers. So, you know, bankruptcies, you know, withholding of rent payments and combining that with some of the secular trends we've seen with, with you know, in-person shopping uh, to begin with, were reflected in a fairly material way on the valuation side. So as, as an example, you know, I, we pulled out sort of everything, every regional or super regional mall that transferred in 2020 or 2021 that was subsequently revalued. And on average, uh, it's been about a 60% decrease from the from the issuance appraisals on those. And we've seen a fair number that exceed 70% discounts and, and even into the, the low 80%. And you know, one thing that we've looked at um, for, review, uh, for appraisals, you know, the actual physical appraisal that we reviewed uh, in detail, there's a fairly consistent band of cap rates on those anywhere from 15 to 20% based on either the appraiser's assumptions or, uh, or what we saw versus a, a, a previous cash flow. Um, you know, loans that were, that were you know, stressed ahead of time or, or cuspy, uh, much riskier as we looked at these through the surveillance process, uh, as borrowers became less likely to come, come out of pocket to, to fund shortfalls. You know, even, you know, even good borrowers uh, were cutting bait on, on some properties when it became clear they were underwater. Uh, you know, there were some specific markets that, were, that were, you know, showed some outsized risk. Uh, New York Hotel, Houston office, Houston Hotel, Chicago office and hotel. Uh, sort of just, you know, the, the acceleration of some trends that we saw pre-pandemic. Uh, and, and I guess going back to hotels, you know, it appears likely that there's some leisure travel that's going to pick up here or, or started to pick up um, already. And, you know, I think we generally viewed hotels, uh, especially uh, hotels that were um, uh, performing well pre-pandemic uh, as better positioned to recover. And I think this is borne out in what we saw in some of the appraisals on hotels where, you know, reporting an as is and as stabilized value, seeing a much bigger difference between the as is and the as stabilized than we were seeing on the retail side. Um, and then, you know, looking forward, I think there's still still some some uh, stress on, you know, hotels depend on a business travel, convention travel. Uh, you know, we expect those those to kind of linger for a bit longer. So I have sped through my slides because, frankly, what everybody else has after me is much more interesting than my than my stats, so I, I apologize. Everything this is captured in the slide deck, which will be available. Uh, but now for the time being, I'll turn it over to Gwen, the rest of the team, and they're gonna walk through some of the specific deals and the rating actions we took and what the drivers uh, on, a, on a deal specific level are. Thank you, Dave. And uh, I was trying to be a good co-pilot with the, the slides. Sorry, we got a <laughs> little tangled on those. Um, oh, that's quite all right. But great obviously you know it's been a, a challenging time and so we asked some of the the team members that participated in the review cycle um, to discuss some of the more interesting deals and there was no shortage of those uh, we will start with Tim Burke who is going to walk us through the C sale 2015 c2 transaction great thanks Gwen um, so yeah this transaction was brought to committee in March 2021 
uh, where DBRS Morningstar downgraded four classes, all sub-investment grades, and assigned negative trends to six classes, including two investment grade ratings. At the time of the review, about 34% of the pool was either on the services watch list or in special servicing. Um, the rating downgrades were driven um, mostly by our hypothetical liquidation scenarios for five loans that were in special servicing at the time of the review, which began to materially erode the credit support towards the bottom of the capital stack. Uh, speaking to the negative trends, so that, that was multi-pronged. So firstly, our con continued concerns with the loans and special servicing and the ultimate resolution of those loans. Secondly, numerous performance-related issues on the servicer's watch list, and specifically loans in the top 15. And lastly, there's regional mall exposure in the top 15 that could pose additional risk in the future. So as of the most recent remittance, the transaction has a trust amount of $1.24 billion, representing a collateral reduction of just shy of 10% since issuance. The transaction itself is made up of 109 loans secured by 149 properties and by DBRS Morningstar property type, the largest concentration included retail with about 41% of the pool, office about 20% and lodging with 16% of the pool. <clears throat> and there was nine loans, about 9.5% of the pool, flagged for varying levels of delinquencies on debt service payments. There's eight loans currently, um, about 8% of the pool in special servicing and 25 loans, but 28% of the pool is on the services watch list currently. I'll just go to the next slide, Glenn, please. Uh, so the largest loan special servicing was the depot. It was secured by 642 bed student housing property in Akron, Ohio, uh, serving the students of the University of Akron. Uh, so the loan ha has been in special servicing for quite some time, so since July 2016, and the property has been real estate owned since February 2020. Prior to the loan's transfer to special servicing, performance declines related to supply increases in the market were noted, and the property continues to underperform issuance expectations with only a 57% occupancy rate at the beginning of the 2020-2021 academic year. And it's currently only 37% pre-leased for the 2021-2022 academic year. And uh, prior to the pandemic, the loan was struggling significantly with the oversupply of student housing in the housing market, which has only been exacerbated by uh, during COVID-19 with the reduction and removal of in-class learning and on-campus events in 2020. The most recent appraisal obtained by the special servicer dated July 2020 showed and has his value of 16.9 million, down from 24 million uh, value as of the August 2019 appraisal and well below the issuance value of 46 million. And this loan was hypothetically liquidated from the pool for this review and that resulted in a hypothetical loss severity in excess of 70%. Uh, let's go to the next slide, Gwen, please. Um, yes, yeah, so the second largest loan in special servicing was Bayshore Mall. Uh, secured by a regional mall in Eureka, California. The loan transferred to the special servicer in October 2020. However, the loan has been delinquent since August 2020, and it's currently 90 plus days delinquent on its debt service payments. Uh, property performance began to suffer at year in 2019 when Sears vacated Anchor Pad, and as of November 2020, the property is only 68% occupied. Uh, remaining anchor tenants include a Walmart, Kohl's, Sportsman Warehouse, Bed Bath and Beyond, and Ross Dresser Less. The property at issuance was appraised for $69 million, equating to a loan-to-value ratio of 63.4% based on the pool balance. However, given the performance decline, outstanding delinquency, and headwinds facing retail, specifically non-trophy regional malls, the property's value has likely decreased. <clears throat> and according to the servicer, the borrower, uh, who is Brookfield Properties Retail, will actually be transitioning the property back to the lender. So for our analysis, uh, we assume the haircut uh, to the issuance value and this loan is also hypothetically liquidated from the trust, resulting in a hypothetical loss severity approaching 40%. Thanks, Tim. Obviously, some some interesting loans. Of you know, I think what's important to note is those were exhibiting performance declines prior to COVID. So just kind of layering the COVID stress on that, um, both have deteriorated further. And you mentioned earlier that we did assign negative trends to six classes and two of those were investment grade rated. You know, that, that's signaling that we're continuing to monitor some developments for the transaction. So, you know, can you speak specifically to, to what things we are continuing to look at for this deal? Yeah, definitely, Gwen. So, yeah, in addition to our concerns with the loans in uh, special servicing, there's also currently 25 loans on the services watch list. A uh, vast majority of those loans have been flagged for performance-related issues and many of which are secured by lodging and retail assets. Uh, specifically in the top 15, there are five loans with performance-related issues. Four of those are secured by lodging properties located in New York City, Beverly Hills, 
North Reddington Beach, it's approximately 30 miles from Tampa, and Bend, Oregon. And all four of those loans have been flagged for low DSCRs. And although those loans have not been delinquent on debt service payments so far, uh, we do recognize that the risk profile for those loans has increased greatly since issuance. Uh, in addition to the watch list, um, there are in the top 15, there are two super regional malls, uh, Westfield Wheaton and Westfield Trumbull. And although these ones aren't on the watch list or in special servicing, we are continuing to monitor those. So specifically speaking, the Wheaton has uh, noteworthy exposure to JCPenney and Macy's, uh, as well as declining sales within the JCPenney. And Trumbull, uh, similarly, has exposure to Macy's and JCPenney, as well as a vacant Lord & Taylor space. And it's had significant declines in cash flow, approximately 35% since issuance. And for those reasons, this loan has also been placed on the Debris Morningstar hot list. So yeah, those are the loans of a concern that we're continuing to monitor uh, going forward with the transaction. Great, yeah, definitely loans to watch. And then I guess just anything since the review in March that's happened with this transaction that you think is worth pointing out? Yeah, so since the last remittance has come out, uh, a loan in special servicing at the time of review is Candlewood Suite Syracuse. Uh, it's quite small, so it's only about 0.3% of the pool. Uh, however, utilize the discounted payoff option for $2.5 million as its final resolution. And uh, during our analysis, we did uh, hypothetically liquidate this one as well from the pool with a 15% 15 haircut to its most recent October 2020 value, $2.7 million, uh, which has been uh, declined significantly from issuance of $7 million. And we estimated a loss severity of about $2.9 million. And with a new remittance uh, that's showing a loss of 2.4 million for that loan. So nice job, DVRS Morningstar surveillance team on that loss estimate. Uh, thanks very much, Tim. That was a great overview. That's definitely an interesting transaction. And I think it's this one that we'll continue to be bringing up as things progress in the review cycle. Um, I'd like to move next to Bill Tierney. He's gonna walk us through a 2014 transaction, the COM 2014 CCRE 20 transaction. So, uh, Bill, I'll leave it up to you. Okay, thanks, Gwen. Yeah, so COM 2014 CCRE 20 is a transaction that we last reviewed in March of 2021. And as part of that review, we just decided to take down uh, ratings actions across five classes. Uh, classes E, F, and G were are notched down, ranging between one and two notches, as well as two IO classes. We also took negative trends on the stack as well. Uh, just quickly before I get into some of those ra the rationale behind those ratings actions, uh, just give you a quick overview of the um, of the deal. This deal is paid down by 17% since issuance. Uh, that's inclusive of amortization as well as the payoff of seven loans and the proceeds, liquidation proceeds from one loan that liquidated in back of March, uh, December of 2020. And that liquidated for a loss of $13 million. And that was absorbed by the first loss piece in class H, which is unrated by us. Um, the fees, there are 12 loans with this, uh, that are defeated fees represent 17.5% of the deal. Um, but the real driver and uh, the, the, the real driver for this loan and the reason why we decided to take rating actions is the specialty service loans. Um, at uh, when we looked at this in March, we did have eight loans with the special servicer that represented 20% of the pool balance. Uh, since then, one loan has transferred back to the master servicer. So presently there are uh, seven loans with the uh, special servicer at 18% uh, of the pool balance. Um, and we, we, we had forecasted losses. We had liquidation, a hypothetical liquidation scenario losses across three of those loans. Um, and a lot of those, um, so a lot of that, those drivers across those loans are really putting a lot of downward pressure, particularly at the bottom of the stack, the capital stack, where we do have thin classes. As I mentioned, class H is unrated. It does have a balance of 25 million, but right above that, you do have class G at 17 million and class F at 11 million. And with liquidation scenario of $37 million in losses across three of those loans, it's really going to be putting a lot of stress and pressure on those bottom classes. And that was warning that warranted it, the rating downgrade. Uh, in addition, the other thing that we're continuing, to continuing to watch is the interest shortfalls in this deal. Um, interest shortfalls have incre increased up the stack to class E. Class E received about 83% of its scheduled interest payment. And that was due to just because of uh, the number of specialty service loans. Uh, we do have one, we did have that one liquidation back last year. We do have one REO loan. And as the ACERs on those loans increase, so will the interest shortfalls in the capital stack. Um, so as I mentioned, that class was receiving interest shortfalls. Uh, right above it is class D. It is investment grade rating at triple B low. Uh, because of the rising interest shortfalls, we decided to take the trend on that class to negative from stable to negative. We didn't make any change to the rating on that class. Um, so 
Uh, I wanted to get into some of the specialty service loans, the highlighted loans that are driving the needle for our losses. Uh, I'll start off with, uh, we do have two hospitality properties that are backed in the top 10 of this deal. The first of which is the Crown Plaza. It is um, located in its full service hotel, 207 key full service hotel in Houston. Uh, Texas, which is uh, just about northwest of the CBD, about five miles north of the Galleria submarket. And this one transferred to special servicing in May of 2020 for payment default. Um, really, the performance on this one has really been deteriorating over the last few years. It's a combination of a couple of factors, one being obviously the downturn in the uh, market there with the energy sector, as well as supply concerns. A lot of uh, newer hotels had opened up in this area. I think Houston was one of the largest hotel uh, cities in the country that uh, had added hotels back in 2019. So, you know, the combination of the supply as well as market factors with the energy sector have really contributed to the downcline, the, the downward trend on this property. So as of year end 2019, the most recent year end number, we did have a DSCR of only 0.59. Uh, and the most recent commentary in this property is that the um, lender is uh, the the the, the, um, the sponsor is working with the lender to transition this property over to uh, via a deed and lieu transaction. So uh, the most recent appraisal was as of June of 2020. It valued it at 25.9 percent. That was a 47 percent. Uh, um, uh, decrease from our ad issuance appraisal. And our, based on our liquidation scenario, it resulted in a 35% loss severity. So the other hotel that I want to talk about is the Doubletree Beachwood. It is the 10th largest one at the, in the pool. It's a $24 million loan. It is a full 404 full service hotel in, located in Beachwood, Ohio, which is about 13 miles east of Cleveland. This one, um, it, 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 again, similar to the Crown Plaza, uh, was underperforming prior to the pandemic. And really, once the pandemic hit, was really the final coffin for this loan. It transferred this to the special service during April of 19, 2019. April of uh, 2019 and became REO right when the pandemic really was starting to surface in, in December of 2020. Uh, very similar deterioration in performance. Uh, you know, this hotel is an older hotel. It really hasn't had much uh, renovation since uh, issuance when it went, underwent a very significant flag conversion back in 2013. Uh, but really hasn't experienced any renovation since then. And uh, it really it really was benefiting early on on the, the new the new flag, as well as demand drivers like the, the Republican uh, convention back in 2016. But really after that, performance really was flat. And again, this one uh, really was exacerbated by the pandemic and transferred back over to the trust in December of 2020. Um, we, we there's an updated appraisal on this one at 9.7, uh, 76. So that was a 76 million dollar drop from our ad issuance appraisal, and really we really can't go any lower on this one. We do have a very high loss severity on this one at 99 percent. Um, and so finally, the last deal I would like to talk about is the fourth largest loan in the pool. It is the uh, Harwood Center. It is a um, has a whole loan balance of 85 million, but only 56 of it is contributed to the subject transaction. The loan is backed by a 36 tower, 36 story, 724,000 square foot office tower in this Dallas CBD. Uh, this one transferred to special in May of 2020 for imminent monetary default. Uh, at that time, the bar was unable to fund TI obligations. And again, performance on this one also deteriorated in recent times. Um, the largest tenant, which is Omnicom Group, uh, re significantly reduced its footprint at the property from 334,000 square feet to about uh, 178,000 square feet, really reducing almost half its space. And that brought occupancy down from 91% as of year end 2019 to 69%, 69% as of uh, first quarter 2020. And occupancy further declined in first quarter of 2021 when its third largest tenant, the department, it was a GSA, the Department of Education, where represent 9% of the space, also vacated. And we kind of anticipated them to vacate. They initially had a March 2020 lease expiration, and we're only doing short-term lease uh, renewals at that time, and they vacated uh, in this first quarter. So an update on appraisal on this one, uh, value the property and, and um, as an as-is valuation of 87.7. They did have a stabilized value of 120 million, which, per, which definitely per, um, you know, has upside if the bar is able to backfill the space. But for the as-is um, valuation, it was an at 30% decrease from our ad issuance appraisal. Um, and that valuation reflects an LTV of, of, of 97%. 
Thanks, Bill. Yeah, the Harvard Center loan is it's somewhat of an outlier. I think it's the only office property that we're featuring across this webinar. You guys are going to hear malls, malls, malls coming up. But um, is there, you know, anything interesting or noteworthy about the the risks for that loan and any of the mitigating factors that that stand out to you? Yeah, I mean, you, you know, you do see occupancy trending down where it's currently at 60%, and it's really going to present a challenging time for the bar to be able to backfill that space anytime soon. Uh, Reese has uh, some market conditions in Dallas CBD at 29, bit market vacancy at 29.5%, and that trend is expected to increase to about 30, Reese has it increasing to 33% within the next 12 months. Um, furthermore, there's, another, there's, an, there's a record, there's a number of, of vacant space in the immediate area. Uh, directly across the street is the Bryan Town. Power. It is also in a, in a CMBS transaction as a JP Morgan 2020 2010 deal, uh, and that property is also s facing similar uh, story. Uh, um, Oxby had been trending down as as uh, the most recent servicing commentary on that loan uh, indicated that Oxby was only 34% on that transaction. Uh, this, it was transferred over to the special servicer for maturity default. Um, and um, and most recently, uh, the borrower had requested a, a modification that was denied. And mo most recently, they're trying to initiate a short sale. Uh, furthermore, there was another property right around the corner. It's the 56-story Renaissance Tower uh, located on Elm Street. That also is only 65% leased. And most recently, that was transferred back to its lenders via a foreclosure. So just record, just a tremendous amount of vacant space in the immediate areas is really going to hinder the bar to be able to backfill this, uh, the, 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 the space anytime soon. Maybe they can do condo conversions for all these people moving to Texas. It might be a thing to consider. Um, yeah. Didn't highlight any malls. Is there any retail exposure in this transaction that is noteworthy? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, we don't have any uh, exposure to regional malls, but we do have retail exposure. It is uh, the sixth largest loan, and coincidentally, this is with the special servicer. It is the Beverly Connection. It is a $175 million whole loan, of which only 43 was contributed to the trouble, uh, subject trust. Um, it is the sixth largest loan in the, in the deal, and it is backed by a two-story, 334,000-square-foot open-air uh, retail anchored center. Um, this one is anchored by a Target, a Marshalls, a Nordstrom Rack, a Ross. Um, and this loan did transfer to the special servicer in August of 2020. Uh, that was due for a payment default uh, due to the pandemic and the restrictions. So the borrower was really requesting COVID relief. Um, they had submitted a request for COVID relief, um, but nothing to that point, nothing was accepted. Those requests were, re were rejected. Um, but this one had maintained very stable performance leading up to the pandemic. It was only not, it was 95% occupied uh, with cash flow up 4% over, over issuance and was covering on a DSCR of 1.5 times. Um, we did receive an updated appraisal on this one as well. It was revalued in October of 2020 for 242 million. Uh, and that reflects a very stable LTV of 72.3%. So, you know, as we, you know, as the restrictions in, in the California start to ease, we, we expect this loan to, um, you know, return to normal. It's definitely nice to hear a, a relatively mild drop in value there. We're not seeing that for large retail, uh, as you will see as we get to the rest of these deals. So thanks very much, Bill. That was a great overview of that 2014 deal. We have a Another 2014 transaction teed up. Braden Scared is going to walk us through the uh, Wells Fargo 2014 LC16 transaction. So, Braden, you want to take it away? Yeah, of course, Gwen. So, we took rating action on Wells Fargo 2014 LC16 in the beginning of March of this year, uh, where five classes were downgraded and one class was assigned a negative trend. So, as of the April 2021 reporting, 70 of the original 82 loans remain in the pool, representing a collateral reduction of approximately 21.8% since issuance. So to start off, the transaction is very concentrated by property type as 48.4% of the transaction uh, consists of loans secured by retail assets. So retail properties remain particularly sensitive to the ongoing risk related to COVID-19. However, the rest of the pool is quite much more granular. So additionally, there are nine loans representing 9.5% of the pool on the servicer's watch list, 
and eight loans representing 31.1% of the pool in special servicing. So in total, approximately 40.6% of the pool is being monitored for some sort of credit concern. So there was quite substantial downgrades that actually led into the investment grade classes. So with our March 2021 review, classes B, C, D, E, and F were downgraded. Um, class C now carries a negative trend, while class, classes D, E, and F do not carry a trend as they reference classes with a C rating. Uh, we're also seeing short interest shortfalls for the bottom rated classes associated with the largest loans in special servicing. So the rating downgrades a negative trend generally reflect the updated loss projections that we had primarily for the two largest loans in the pool, which is the Woodward Center and Montgomery Mall. Both loans are secured by regional malls and are delinquent and currently with the special servicer. So I'll first start off with Woodward Center as this is the largest loan in the pool, representing 14.8%. The loan is secured by a super regional mall in Woodbridge, New Jersey, and that's about 30 miles southwest of New York City. The Class B Mall, originally built in 1971, is owned and operated by affiliates of Brookfield Property Partners. Uh, similar to kind of the other mall properties that we've seen in this pool, the loan has reported cash flow declines for several years prior to the pandemic. The, the closures of the former Lord and Taylor anchor and the Sears anchor in early 2020 further hindered property performance, and that brought occupancy down to 73.1%. The loan transferred to special servicing in May 2020, and then the collateral was reappraised at year end in December 2020 for a value of 104 million. This is down 71.6% from the issuance value of 366 million. So with that value, the implied LPV increased to 226% compared to roughly 65% at issuance. So Based on the December 2020 value, the loan was liquidated from the pool and the scenario resulted in implied loss severity in excess of 70% or $79.5 million in loss. So just with that loan by itself, um, the implied loss of nearly $80 million wipes out uh, the unrated class, class G, with, with the balance of 32.8 million, wipes out class F, class E, and then also goes into the investment grade rated class, class D, which was previously rated triple B low. So as you can see, that one loan is very pivotal for all of the ratings for the pool. Um, the next driver loan that I'm gonna talk about is Montgomery Mall, which is the second largest remaining loan in the pool representing 7.1% of the pool. So Montgomery Mall is a regional mall in North Wales, Pennsylvania, approximately 22 miles North of Philadelphia. And it's owned and operated by Simon Property Group. The mall lost non-collateral anchor in Sears in February 2020 and then later transferred to special servicing in June 2020. So according to the September 2020 rent roll, the mall had an occupancy rate um, of 74.2%, which declined quite a bit from the issuance uh, occupancy of 92.4%. And also another area of concern with this loan is that the servicer had previously noted that the sponsor will uh, was unwilling to inject additional capital into the collateral. Um, the loan was then reappraised in August 2020 for a value of 61 million, and this is down 61.7% from the issuance value of 195 million. And this uh, resulted in the implied loss severity in excess of 50% or 24.6 million. So the common theme themes that we're kind of seeing with these two driver loans that they're secured by these class B or tier two malls outside of poor markets. Um, they've seen closures of their anchors, they have dated interiors and have experienced occupancy declines over the past few years dating before COVID. And this has all led to these sizable reductions in value. Thanks, Braden. Uh, I'll borrow one of my comments from earlier this year, eye popping value declines. I mean, you're talking dropping from 366 million to just over 100 million in six years time, which, you know, obviously a lot of developments with that property that we've been monitoring, but I think it's, it's a great showcase of what we're dealing with here. And, you know, I, as Dave mentioned earlier, and as you guys were talking about, you know, we are further stressing those values. There's not usually a big delta. There's not a, a lot of upside that the appraisers are giving from a stabilization standpoint. So, you know, our, our view is that once they hit this point, you know, the likelihood of any meaningful resolution uh, getting, you know, proceeds back to the trust is, is pretty low given the, the sharp value decline. So we're, we're further stressing that value, assuming, you know, the just the sheer glut of, of assets that are going to be in front of the special servicer to resolve 
um, is likely going to push those those actual resolution prices even lower. So, you know, obviously the, those small loans that you spoke to were the big drivers. Any other loans in the deal trans that we're monitoring or contributed to the actions, Braden? Yeah, so I think with this transaction, we'll just be primarily monitoring and checking for updates for the regional malls in the pool. Um, another loan that's in special servicing that we've been monitoring closely now for kind of a few years is the Oak Court Mall loan. It's only about 1.9% of this transaction, but it's also secured in another transaction. And that's been in special servicing since May 2020. So we've been previously monitoring the sponsor, which is Washington Prime Group, uh, just concerning its ability to fund shortfalls for the Oak Court Mall loan. Um, and with our March 2021 review, uh, we assumed a liquidation scenario resulting in an implied loss severity in excess of 70%. So it seems like everything is playing out as expected as with the most recent reporting. It shows that the sponsor is um, going to be giving back uh, the property to the trust. And given what we know, the loan will likely fall in line with our loss expectations. Uh, we also got an update for the Montgomery Mall loan with the servicer reporting that the sponsor is going to be proceeding with the foreclosure. And Kind of outside of those um, three loans in special servicing, we'll also be monitoring the other five loans in special servicing, which is one um, anchored retail property. There's three limited service hotels kind of outside of core markets and a multifamily property. So kind of seeing how all those play out and seeing how they reach a resolution should be really interesting moving forward. Interesting is one way to put it, Braden. Thank you very much. Uh, Thanks. Let's travel even further back in time. Let's go to 2012. Uh, Alex is going to walk us through a uh, 2012 C10 transaction, and I will get to that slide and, and turn it over to you. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, Gwen. Uh, so I'll be discussing the 2012 C10 deal. Uh, when we started looking at this one, right off the bat, the first thing that caught my eye was the property composition. Uh, retail and lodging properties make up over 60% of the pool, and they happen to be the two most stressed asset classes in 2020. Taking a closer look at the retail component of this deal, it became quite clear that this would be the main driver for our rating actions, as we have five loans secured by regional malls, making up 30% of the pool. And I think this is quite interesting since uh, this is a deal composition that we don't really see anymore. Five malls all within the top 15 largest loans of this pool and all located in what we deem to be tertiary markets. And as you may guess, these loans have faced headwinds in 2020. Of these five mall loans, three are being monitored on the servicer's watch list and one transferred to special servicing. These were loans that we've been monitoring for several years now, but when you factor in stresses brought about by the pandemic and on top of other issues that I'll get into later, uh, the risks with these loans are amplified and were the driving force behind our downgrades and negative trends on the two junior most classes. So jumping into the loan analysis, I'll start first with the sole specialty service loan in the deal, which is Rogue Valley Mall. Uh, this is a mall in Medford, Oregon that transferred to special in July 2020 for payment default related to the pandemic. The mall was originally owned by GGP, but was sold to Brixton Capital in 2016 for a price of 61.5 million, well below the issuance appraised value of 80 million. And uh, this implies an LTV of over 80% based on the outstanding loan amount at the time of purchase. The property does have exposure to several struggling retailers, including JCPenney and two Macy's stores. And there's also over 60% of collateral NRA that's scheduled to roll before the loan's October 2022 maturity date. Performance-wise, the loan had reported declining cash flows since 2013, and although the 2019 DSCR remained above break-even, it was still well below the issuer's underwritten DSCR. And while the mall is located in a tertiary market, it is noteworthy that it's the only mall within an 80-mile radius, so there's not much in the way of competition. But even with the lack of competition, the downward trend in performance has been hard to reverse. You then throw in the pandemic on top of that, and you get a situation where very little rent was being collected and the borrower ultimately decided to default on the loan. In terms of a workout strategy, a service or commentary suggests that a loan modification or foreclosure could be pursued, but a foreclosure moratorium in Oregon in 2020 has slowed this process. So we'll be keeping a close eye on this as the year progresses. 
In terms of our analysis for this loan, we took a fairly punitive approach and assumed a liquidation scenario with a sizable haircut to the issuance value. Now, we've already seen that there's been a value decline of at least 20% when the mall was sold in 2016. And with the way retail has trended since then, uh, it's very likely that there's been even more of a value decline. So with our analysis here, we assumed a liquidation scenario with a loss severity in excess of 40%. I'd also like to discuss one of the watchlisted loans. Uh, Dayton Mall is the largest loan on the watchlist and was being monitored well before the pandemic for cash flow declines, as well as two vacant non collateral anchor boxes. Similar to Rogue Valley, this loan has reported cash flow decline since 2013, falling from a DSCR over 2.5 down to 0.9 as of year end 2020. Collateral occupancy has also been declining as well, going from 95% in 2018 to 93% in 2019, and now down to 82% as of December 2020. On top of performance and tenancy issues, the mall's operator, Washington Prime Group, has struggled greatly in 2020. And they've gone as far to say that there's substantial doubt about the company's ability to continue as a going concern. And they haven't ruled out a restructuring through a chapter 11 filing. Uh, to their credit though, payments on this loan have been current through 2020 and the first quarter of 2021. But the prospect of refinancing this loan with its September 2022 maturity date approaching uh, seems a bit optimistic given where things currently stand. So to summarize some of our main factors across these malls, uh, tertiary markets, struggling retailers, declining occupancy and cash flow, and the prospect of declining values are all considerations in how we analyze these loans. Uh, we also have to account for how we see the next year looking for these malls, given that they're all up for maturity in 2022. Issuance LTVs for the five loans range from 54% to 70%, but given how the retail landscape looked in 2012 versus how it looks now, uh, it may be difficult for several of these to secure refinancing. And this was a big reason for why we opted to downgrade those two bonds and also assign negative trends. Thanks, Alex. Yeah, this, this transaction is certainly in a unique position and that all these loans are gonna come due. And, you know, as Dave mentioned, that's been, you know, something that we're monitoring. We think the additional stress of the current environment is gonna present obviously, you know, additional hurdles for these sponsors trying to, to find takeout financing. So you know, we did downgrade those bonds, but we also confirmed a lot of bonds and we, we have a lot of exposure to upcoming maturity. Were there positive things within the transaction that you guys noted that sort of, you know, supported obviously the, the majority of the bonds being confirmed? Yeah, uh, there's a few things to note, both from the loan level and transaction level that provide mitigating factors to some of the negatives I've discussed. Uh, so firstly, uh, simply having regional malls in the deal doesn't necessarily mean losses are imminent and further downgrades will come. In contrast to the previously mentioned malls, the second largest loan in this deal, which is secured by the Concord Mills Mall in Concord, North Carolina, uh, it's shown that it's been able to sustain strong performance even through a pandemic, reporting a DSCR of 3.56 times and greatly benefiting from a committed sponsor in Simon Properties Group, which has continually invested in the mall while also maintaining diverse tenancy highlighted by a non-traditional anchor in Bass Pro Shops. The whole loan for this mall is 225 million, of which 110 million is securitized in this transaction and makes up 11% of the pool. So we view this loan as a positive for the deal, despite it being a regional mall in a tertiary market. From a structural level, uh, noteworthy credit positive items include a fairly thick first loss piece at just over 44 million, uh, which is more common among transactions of this vintage. And there's also been notable pay down of 22% and defeasance of 9%, which means healthier credit support throughout the capital stack. And this gave us comfort to confirm all of the investment grade classes in this deal. Yeah, those are great points. And I think the fact that when we look at this, there was only one loan in special servicing. I mean, that's quite, especially with the mall concentration that you have in the deal, I think that was definitely surprising as we were working through that review. So uh, thanks very much, Alex. Uh, we're going to save the the longest time travel and the best for last going back to 2011 Wasik Chuktai is going to walk us through the uh, GSMS 2011 GC5 transaction. So I'll get to that slide and turn it over to you Wasik. Thank you Glenn. Yeah I'll start off with an overview on this transaction. So with the April remittance we are looking at 21 of the original 74 loans. 
uh, for an overall balance of 696 million. Uh, there's 12 loans on the watch list and they're on there for a variety of reasons, including low DSCR ratios, tenant rollover risk, maturity, occupancy, and deferred maintenance. Uh, also, there's four loans that are currently in special servicing. Uh, two of these transferred recently in February and April of this year, and the other two uh, were there at the time of September and August of last year. Also, there's four loans that have fully defeased as well. So that's a brief overview, and we can dive into the rating actions uh, that we took with the December 2020 surveillance review. Um, so we did downgrade five classes and four of those were investment grade classes and more notably the class B certificate, which was previously rated triple E at uh, triple A that came down to uh, double A high. And also we changed the trends on classes B, C and D to negative from stable. And uh, we confirmed uh, the rating actions on four classes, A3, A4, AS and XA. Now with those rating actions, I wanted to talk a little bit about the drivers behind those, um, the downgrades and the negative trends. And we can pretty much tie back to three specific loans on the top 15 loans that are secured by uh, regional malls. And these represented about 25% of the pool balance. And all three of these malls, which I'll touch on in more detail, these are all located in secondary markets that have shown increased risk from uh, issuance. More notably, the second largest loan in the pool, Park Place Mall, which I'll touch on. And uh, the others were you know, Tucson, Arizona, Beaumont, Texas, Plattsburgh, New York, all showing cash flow declines, sponsorship issues, you know, bankruptcy filings. So a lot going on with those three loans, which I, I think is interesting from a discussion standpoint. Um, and further to that, there was, you know, uh, another consideration was the upcoming maturity dates on these uh, you know, remaining loans in the transaction, as all these are expected to mature in July and August, but given the modifications in place and, and the status of some of these in special servicing, that resolution time uh, might be extended as well. And then finally, the realized losses with the most recent omit is at 7 million um, to the honorary class G certificate. And uh, I'll talk a little bit more about how we looked at those uh, loss scenarios for those special service loans. Perfect. So looking at the first loan I wanted to highlight was the Park Place Mall. Uh, and this one transferred to special servicing in October 2020 due to imminent uh, monetary default. And as I noted, this is in a secondary market in Tucson, Arizona. Um, the loan is secured by a 1.1 million square foot regional mall, of which 478,000 is part of the square feet as part of the collateral. Um, and at issuance, the, it was anchored by Sears, Macy's, and Dillard's, but uh, Sears was, re was replaced by round one bowling, Macy's closed and Dillard's remains at the property. Collateral tenants include uh, Century Theaters, Total One and More and H&M. And this loan is uh, sponsored by Brookfield Properties which acquired the, the property from GGP in 2018. Uh, speaking to you know, the correspondence we had with the servicer with our December 2020 review, and the update on the status of this loan. Um, they did note that the sponsor is no longer supporting the asset with additional equity infusions. And at the time, the loan was uh, more than 30 days delinquent. And the, the workout strategy was that they were continuing to discuss with the sponsor and dual tracking foreclosure. Um, so the, the way we looked at it, and as it's noted, we had the issuance value of 313 million. Um, the way we looked at it was uh, given the moderate going in LTV of 62%, we, we applied a pretty substantial haircut on the issu issuance appraisal value uh, of 55%. Uh, we also applied a stressed advancing figure to arrive at a, at a moderate loss severity of 30%. Um, but given the size of the loan being 167 million, uh, despite the moderate loss severity, this did end up being you know, a, a sizable uh, loss uh, projection for this loan uh, with the ratings, uh, the loss projections going into class F and uh, wiping out the unrated class G. Uh, but overall, uh, with the possibility of the sponsor, you know, turning the property over to the trust and the challenge, challenges associated with disposing the asset in this current, you know, retail environment, uh, that's essentially supported the, the downgrades and the negative trends. And we do expect a 
potentially a higher loss severity for this loan at resolution. Um, moving on to the next slide, Parkdale Mall Crossing. Uh, this one is secured by a 663,000 square foot portion of a 1.3 million regional mall. And uh, this one's in Beaumont, Texas. Um, this loan did receive a loan modification uh, as a result of the borrower's request for COVID-19 relief um, and the sponsor, CBL and Associates. They filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection um, and they were seeking to reduce their debt and other obligations by 1.5 billion. But with the loan modification that was approved, this allowed for interest only payments for July to December, 2020 with principal curtailment uh, payments required in November, 2020 and February, 2021. But the sponsor did appear to be committed to the property um, and it is considered a tier two asset. And I do wanna know this is the only regional mall in its area with you know, the closest competing mall located 50 miles away. Uh, but you know, as I noted, given the concerns and the increased risk from issuance with the CBL's bankruptcy, um, and you know the potential for significant value decline. Um, this is one that was also a, a driver in our rating actions, and uh, you know we believe that the servicer should be incentivized to devise a resolution as long as CBL holds on to the property and is committed to the modification. And then lastly uh, is Champlain Center. Uh, this is a regional mall located in Plattsburgh, New York. Um, this one is on. DBRS Morningstar's hot list as it uh, at the time when it returned to the master servicer following the special servicer's approval, approval for loan modification. And that it spoke towards uh, the loan being converted to IO uh, from April to September of uh, 2020 uh, with 50% of the accrued interest deferred. Um, and this one is sponsored by Pyramid and with the latest update, which I'll speak on, um, this one has been transferred to special servicing as of the May 2021 reporting. Uh, but this one's a little different in that, you know, given the pandemic can have additional stress on the property, historically the cash flows have been stable and they brought in popular retailers like Hobby Lobby and Ollie's Bargain Outlet. Um, and having exposure, exposure to JCPenney is a challenge and Regal Cinemas uh, with, you know, the lack of big studio releases uh, being a challenge for all theaters across North America. This is one that we're also, you know, expecting a, a, um, a loss at resolution given the recent transfer. I'll kick it back to you, Gwen. Thanks, Blasek. So I'll just, a lot of the questions that I had as you're going through, you were answering for me as you went along. Um, I guess just generally, obviously, this is the the oldest rating action that we're highlighting today being a December rating action so, so long ago. Um, any significant developments since then that you think are worth pointing out? Yeah, for sure. So I, I think uh, with these three loans I uh, discussed, these are ones we're monitoring very closely. Um, at the time, we didn't really have, you know, clarity on the workout for Park Place Mall, but uh, looks like that's still the case with the recent reporting. Um, the servicer noted that they're still determining determining the best course and they're proceeding with dual tracking foreclosure or, or a loan modification. So we're gonna monitor that, that and see kind of what the finalized um, update is uh, for that loan. And then for Parkdale, we do have an update on the workout strategy. Um, given the maturity date in March, uh, they are seeking a loan modification to extend the maturity date. So at this time they are um, gathering info from the borrower as well as you know, simultaneously reserving uh, the rights under the loan document. So we should get kind of more clarity on that loan. And then finally, we're monitoring Champlain Center. This one, the servicer commentary kind of speaks towards the existing modification in place. So because it's a recent transfer back to the special servicer, I think uh, the workout is still going to be determined. But I think this is sort of a similar case as Parkdale where, you know, a potential maturity extension is on the table given the maturity is uh, in May, 2021. Uh, so we should get some, kind of some uh, updates on this one as well. Um, but with, you know, with the transfer to special servicing, uh, this is another loan where we're expecting kind of an extended resolution time and a, a loss at disposition. Thanks, Classic. So we are at time. I'll pull up this slide and uh, 
I was going to have Dave go through what we're looking ahead for. And as he mentioned earlier, this will be distributed. We did get a question in that I think uh, is, is a good one. And it's, it's probably on a lot of, of minds. Uh, the question was, how are you looking at the year end 2020 financials where the actual cash flows are coming in lower than prior years? Um, you know, and not specifically just the malls, but other property types too. Like Dave, do you want to speak a little bit to how we looked at that as part of these reviews? Sure, <clears throat> sure, Gwen. Um, so, so I think one one of the things as we look at the, at, at twenty twenty year end cash flows as, as they come in is understanding what the new normal is. So, you know, for example, on on retail space, you know, I, I think there's been a clear indication in the market. There's been a you know a, a fundamental value reset, especially on the on the regional mall uh, stuff on the hotel side. Um, again, I think I mentioned earlier that, you know, we're looking at this as, you know, where was this property perform performing prior to COVID and, you know, are the demand drivers that are going to come back pretty quickly on the office space. And, and I guess everything should be couched right in, in the context of, you know, as a rating agency, there's, we all, always have cushion built in from, you know, whether it's the issuer's cash flow or a service or reported cash flow. Um, there's always cushion built in. So, you know, it's hard to cast a blanket over how we're going to look at every office cash flow that comes through, but we are going to take a measured approach and and understand. Okay, is this something where where you know cash flow has fallen off five percent, and you know maybe lingers there for a bit, or has something very materially changed in the in the tenant composition of this of this property that's going to make us reevaluate our our cash flow assumptions, and do we therefore need to stress our our probability of defaults and and expected losses accordingly? So. Um, you know, more of a more of a nuanced approach, and and you know, I think we've certainly learned one thing over over the last six months is is you know we can't always uh, rely solely on service reported data to get a clear understanding of what's going on with particular loans. So um, it, it will be you know obviously especially on on say top ten or top fifteen loans backed by office properties, you know we we want to understand what you know what's going on at the, at the specific property, who the tenants are, and you know I think some of that still it's going to take some time to manifest itself as you know, what the new normal for, for work from home, you know, in office, uh, all that kind of stuff comes into play. So, um, you know, nuanced measured approach is the, is the answer. That's right, Dave. That's been the name of the game for the last year and will continue to be the way we look at these going forward. So thank you everybody for joining us today. I think the panelists, everybody did such a great job and I appreciate Rachel and Masaki who pre prepared some data for us as part of the slide. So I want to give a shout out to those behind the scenes as well. So thank you, everybody. Thanks very much. And we look forward to seeing you on the next webinar.